May I call the second session to order? Uh, what do they call it? Arms, the guy in Congress? Someone at arms. Donald, Sergeant at arms, please bring this forum. <laughs> Sergeant at arms, that would be grace. <laughs> Where, where's that beautiful image of the globe? Anyway. Oh, that's your last slide. Oh, thank you, Donald, because I, I work in Thailand, and that was the center of that globe, and the center of India, China is, is right there in that globe. No, please don't go up there. You want to see each other's presentations, I'm sure. You can... Uh, can I ask the panelists to remain in your seats? Because um, you're, you'll be more comfortable looking at the presentation from your seats. And when I introduce you, you can come up and uh, give your talk and then uh, go back to the seat. And then after the end um, I'll, of the speakers, I'll invite everybody to come up and the respondents will be introduced and give their response. So um, it's, an, it's an architect taking charge a little bit differently here. Um, so, uh, I'm Brian McGrath, I am an architect, so I'm in the School of Constructed Environments here at Parsons, the New School for Design. Um, and uh, uh, I am also uh, an incredible beneficiary of the India China Institute, having been a member of the first cohort, um, and uh, where the topic was urbanization and globalization. And, uh, and uh, I think um, it's been a wonderful experience. I, I still work with uh, the cohort there. And with each added cohort, I have a, 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 a new group of friends across India and China. And so I really want to commend Ashok and everyone around India and China Institute, all their supports, for creating something unique in the world. Because now we have uh, 45, 6, 50 scholars, India, China, New School. Um, who are, have been closely working together at least two years, some of us six years. And so I, I think that's an incredible intellectual resource that um, we hope to put forward uh, in the future of India China Institute. So stay tuned. Um, much more interesting things to come. Uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is um, at the new school, um, because I am from Parsons, and we, uh, we really like to be part of these incredibly important discussions about globalization, urbanization, environmentalism, sustainability, uh, poverty and inequality. Um, and so I, I really think um, I'd like to share with you the recent uh, one sentence from the New School's Renewed Vision. And um, because innovation comes from, of course, the Latin nova, which means renew, and we are the new school, and we're kind of old, so we do need to renew. Um, so our renewed vision is we are and will be a university where design and social research drive approaches to studying the issues of our time, such as democracy, urbanization, technological change, economic empowerment, environment, and sustainability, as well as migration. So this is uh, one of the sentences you can find the longer mission statement, um, vision statement online. And, uh, and that's what's bringing together the great uh, social research at the new school with this tremendous, vibrant, innovative design school called Parsons. So um, welcome to the last session on innovation. Uh, so um, this session we are, uh, and again, uh, like Sanjay before me, um, I invite you to read the full biographies in the, in the handout, and I'll, I'll just give a short uh, introduction to each presenter uh, and invite them to the stage. Um, so Jayanta Bandupadhyay is uh, the first speaker, and he's from the Indian Institute of Management, and he's going to talk about situation, situating social innovation for sustainable environments and give you a, a hint at how this group, this cohort, has been working and some of the topics they'll be discussing. Jayanta? Please. Right here. Right. <laughs> no, I'm 
just giving you a short intro. Good afternoon. Uh, mine is a, a short introduction to the detailed presentations that uh, four members of the cohort three uh, will be uh, uh, making here. We thought that uh, the four presentations, and uh, there is a fifth one which uh, belongs to my work, but it is not being presented here. But next week on Tuesday, there is a public lecture about which uh, some announcements have been made and uh, there is a poster around. So there are in total five presentations related to the overall topic of uh, social uh, innovation for sustainable environments in China and India. My role here is to uh, give the unifying framework for the diverse uh, presentations on diverse locations and topics that were based on the specific competence and interest of the six cohort members. In this cohort, which uh, is constituted by six scholars, two from China, two from India and uh, two from the New School USA. Uh, you, will, you have their names from China, Professor uh, Dong Shi Kui. Uh, the second cohort me member from China uh, is uh, unfortunately uh, Mr. Seping, uh, tied up with family responsibilities back home and uh, is not able to uh, come here to make the presentation. The two cohort members from uh, India are uh, Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi and uh, myself, and uh, from the new school, Professor Victoria Marshall and uh, Professor Nidhi Srinivas. So we have four presentations coming up on this particular issue of uh, the social innovation for environmental uh, sustainable, envi sustainable environments in China and India. Now, the task of uh, identifying social innovations in these two countries, characterized by very large population, and this large population has quite a bit of uh, growing material expectations from future, and the countries are on the path of very rapid economic uh, uh, growth to the extent of uh, ranging from 7% to 10% uh, in various years, slowing down a little bit in the recent one or two years, but uh, maximum had been about 9% uh, for India, 10% for China, which is a tremendously large uh, economic uh, sort of output. And like all economic outputs, they have inputs and what uh, can be said as unwanted products being pushed into as pollutants in the water, air, soil. Uh, so th this is a tremendous challenge to, to conceptualize how to identify the, the processes of uh, innovation in addressing the issues of uh, environmental challenges in these two countries. So these uh, six members had been spending uh, of course, they spend their uh, last two and a half years in their own research, of course, in their own home institutions, and there had been occasional uh, meetings for uh, mutual discourses, and uh, these meetings led to a more concrete and more comprehensive understanding of uh, what innovations might mean, and uh, you, will, you will probably get the details from each of the presentations in the short period I have, I can only say that uh, in, the, in the dynamic framework, extremely dynamic framework of uh, both social and economic and probably cultural, political, uh, we found that uh, the social innovations are definitely very important tools to address either identification of environmental uh, degradation issues or working towards environmental uh, rehabilitation of degraded uh, ecosystems. And these 
innovations are the result of a, a diverse inputs, diverse social uh, uh, consciousness. They are operating at various special levels as well as sectoral levels, and they are influenced by the, the political forces in the country, and in turn, they want to influence the political forces in the country. So all this makes the, the whole concept of uh, uh, in, innovation a very interdisciplinary, a very uh, sort of uh, composite process, and hence it has diversity built in. It cannot be a, a almost a singular process through which you can say, this is the starting point of innovation, this is the end point of all innovations. The innovations that we, we study are probably a very small, minute fraction of the total innovations that have been going on in these two countries with such large population and probably a, a quite a creative population. Uh, you, will, you will see there are only indicative uh, examples. So four people probably in two years time of, say, total amount of time devoted a few months. Uh, it is uh, difficult to go into details of the representative nature of the innovations. They will be all scattered, identified one. But there has been a, a quite a bit of intellectual process through which we arrived at this diversity as the basic character of social innovations for sustaining the natural environments. No, no. Now, having said that, and uh, not having uh, uh, enough, more of enough time, I quickly go into introducing what our uh, cohort uh, colleagues uh, will be presenting. The first one by uh, Professor Sanjay Chaturvedi will be addressing the forest movement in the Indian Himalaya, which uh, also is well known by the name of uh, Embrace the Tree Movement or the Chipko Andolan. And it is seen as a, a, uh, a representative, but quite a bit of micro level innovation. The details will obviously come from him. The, the second uh, presentation will be by Professor Dong Shikui, who will be uh, talking about how the communities in the high mountains in the Himalaya, in Nepal, in India, and in uh, the Tibet Autonomous Region of China, they have been uh, innovating to cope with and adapt to uh, impacts of climate change. Again, I will not go into details. They will be coming from the speakers. Professor Nidhi Srinivas will be talking about uh, innovations that uh, non-governmental organizations in arid and semi-arid areas of China and India have been uh, promoting to ensure better water availability. And Professor Victoria Marshall will be talking of an innovative urban design project which is uh, uh, as a systematic process, and that is working on the general field of urban ecology. And as I said, there is another uh, uh, of those case studies on the water features for China and India, which will not be presented by myself here, but uh, on Tuesday there will be. I think there is some time this uh, announcement comes here. and. Uh, with that, I complete my brief introduction because I think it is uh, only the respective presenters who will uh, give you more detailed description of the work done by the third cohort. Thank you very much. Uh, just to repeat, so I have the pleasure of introducing Sanjay Chattavurdi, who's an EC fellow and from Punjab University, going to talk about struggles of innovation, the Chipko movement in retrospect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor Jayantu Bandhupadhyay, for having introduced the theme and all of us. Thank you, India-China Institute, for 
uh, having done me this honor for the last two and a half years. It has been an enormously enriching experience. Uh, I owe so much of debt, intellectual debt, to my colleagues and to my uh, fellows, uh, fellow brothers, uh, that it is very difficult to make this presentation and project it uh, as my own. Uh, there has been a wonderful dialogue that has been going on uh, for the last two years and more. We have met at various places. And I must say that uh, this presentation uh, that I'm making before you today uh, is the result of this enormous churning of ideas and thoughts uh, that has been going on. And uh, having focused in my research on marine environments, looking at uh, Sundarbans in case of India and Zongshinkao uh, Natural Reserve in case of China, uh, I was struck by the uh, insights that I received from, uh, particularly from Professor Jento Bandhopadhyay in the course of my conversations with him. Uh, and I felt that uh, looking at Chipko in retrospect and also in terms of prospects, so please grant me the liberty of having added prospects uh, to the theme of my presentation. Uh, I thought that would be an enormously uh, enriching exercise and uh, because it's a work in progress, I will have this opportunity of inviting your insights and your comments. Uh, first of all, as you can see here, um, there is a bird, migratory bird. And the reason I have put this image is because Chipko uh, has been very creatively imagined and imaginations are so central to all kinds of innovations, particularly social innovations, as a migratory bird. And you would see that I have combined together the tropical forests and the oceans. Uh, because my interest, one of my major interests, has been in the oceans and in the, in the polar regions. Uh, so the point that I'm trying to make here is, number one, that uh, migratory bird is a very useful way of looking at social innovation, particularly Chipko movement. And secondly, geography matters in social innovation. Geographical landscapes do matter a great deal. I, sh I think I should also be very quickly uh, sharing with you my ideas on uh, what I mean by micro-geopolitics. Uh, I, by micro-geopolitics, I mean uh, a socio-spatial strategy adopted by communities and groups located on the margins against the imposed maps of meaning on their universe. Uh, Paul Routledge would call it anti-geopolitics, uh, which, which is an interesting concept, but I would prefer the word uh, micro-geopolitics of resistance against various architectures of domination. And I will try to uh, show through my presentation that Chipko, as uh, Professor Guha also points out, Ramchandra Guha in his book, Unquiet Woods, has been a victim of its own success uh, in the sense that uh, as the movement has been perceived, imagined, represented in official discourses, in, in, in popular uh, framings, Sometimes the real movers and the shapers of, of the movement uh, have been pushed uh, on the margins. Uh, and very different narratives have been attached to what Chipko was, was all about. And I think there are some very important lessons here which I will try to flag very quickly. Now let me start with the roots, because these are two conceptual tools I'm using. Roots, R-O-O-T-S, and roots, R-O-U-T-S. And I think both are extremely important. Roots of Chipko are of philosophical nature. There are ideological moorings of what can be described as a very innovative resistance through Gandhian and Sarvodaya methods, basically non-violent uh, resistance. Now, uh, let me begin with this. The award speech, I quote Shri Sundarlal Bahuguna, who is seen here with his wife, uh, with his very well-known quotation, which is, Ecology is permanent economy. And please pay attention to the image, uh, which is right below here, women of Gadwal uh, carrying this, uh, uh, the, the fodder grass on their backs. And I quote, it must be admitted that to begin with, Chipko was an economic moment and we looked upon forests as a source of employment through tree felling and providing raw material for industries. The long sufferings of hill women have guided the activists to reach new heights in their moment when these preserving mothers of the future generations dictated that forests were their maternal homes, which provided water, 
food, fodder, and fuel. Both the trees and the mothers teach that to live and also to be ready to die for the sake of others proves to be the real foundation, fountain of bliss. Thus came the famous slogan, what do the forests bear? Soil, water, and pure air. Soil, water, and pure air are the basis of life. Now, Mr. Bahuguna himself admitted that to begin with, it was an economic moment. Ecological turns came much later. But it remembers, it needs to be remembered that when Bahuguna was looking at ecology and economy, he was not looking at these two in terms of binary opposites. And I think this quotation, ecology is permanent economy, says it all. Now, sometimes uh, it is forgotten that some of the great philosophical contributions to the Chipko movement, embracing the trees movement, came from two wonderful visionary women. Meera Ben, Madeleine Slade, as she was called, both were disciples of Mahatma Gandhi. And as Meera Ben, I caught, she said, year after year, the floods in the north of India seem to be getting worse. And this year, they have been absolutely devastating. This means that there is something radically wrong in the Himalayas, and that something is without doubt connected with the forests. It is not, I believe, just a matter of deforestation, as some people think, but largely a matter of changes of species. So here was a micro observation of what was going on at the grassroots in the mountains of Garhwal. And see what she says in the second quotation. The barge brings them in no cash for the coffers of the government, whereas the cheer pine is very profitable, yielding as it does both timber and resins. And this statement again brings out very nicely the difference between livelihood geographies and the geopolitics or geoeconomics of profit and profit pursuits. Another very important inspiration of, uh, of, of Chipko comes from what she was called daughter of the Himalayas by the local people, mother of social activism, one who was at the forefront of the anti-alcohol movement. The principles that govern humanity are higher than those that govern the state, she said. A centralized government indifferent to its people, it is a joke. So Sarla Behan and Meera Behan were very important contributors to the philosophy of Chipko sometime, and, and this fact has often been overlooked. Another person who is unfortunately no more was Ghan Sham Lal Raturi, who was also called Sailani. And please note that you know, so much has been written and said about the symbolism of Chipko, which is embracing the trees. And I think here, it's a very deeper meaning of that embrace. He says, I quote, embrace the trees in the forest and save them from being felled, save the treasure of our mountains from being looted away from us, unquote. He also went to another site, and that is the spirit of Chipko, like a migratory bird, went to the Doon Valley, anti-mining uh, uh, exercises there, and he said, I quote, a fight for truth has begun at Sinsaryu, Khala. A fight for rights has begun in Mulko, Thano, Sista. It is a fight to protect our mountains and forests. They give us life. Hug the life of the living trees and streams to your hearts. Resist the digging of mountains, which kills our forests and our streams. A fight for life has begun at Khala, unquote. Now, this cartoon is one of my favorites because it describes very aptly, very graphically, what, uh, what uh, has been called the victim of success. And the cartoon says they are not from Chipko movement. They are footboard travelers thrown out of the speeding buses at the turning. Now, unfortunately, there has been a lot of misreporting of this very important philosophical embracing of the trees. I quote Jayanto Bhattopadhyay, Bhatt Bhatt who wrote a fascinating article in Economic and Political Weekly long back. I quote, a common impression exists all over the world, except in the villages of Gharwal and Kumau, that large number of people, especially women, have been embracing trees to prevent their felling. While the media has played an important role in spreading the positive message of the movement, some journalists have failed miserably to maintain minimum professional standards, have created serious confusions at the international level on the above question, unquote. Now, there have been a lot of instances of this. If you look at Ramchandra Guha's book, towards the end of his analysis, he also comes out with various stories. One more recent one was published in The Guardian 
on 8th of March 2011, it said, when Vandana Shiva and women villagers wrapped their arms around trees to prevent them from being felled by commercial loggers, the name tree hugger was born. Since then, Shiva's influence on the global environmental movement has grown uncaught. So I'm just using it as an example to show as to how some of the real movers and shapers of the movement came to be eclipsed. Now, let me show them some of them here. For example, Dhoom Singh Negi, Gansham Raturi. They were the real movers and shapers, along with Gauri Devi, along with lots of commoners, you know, whose names perhaps we even do not know. Because at one moment, Chipko became a part of the popular socio-spatial consciousness. And then when Sri Sundarlal Bahuguna undertook that Padyatra, foot march, in 80, from 81 to 83, it was about 2,800 kilometers from Kashmir to Kohima, then the question that I would like to pose is, does the Himalayan Chipko Padyatra undertaken by Bahuguna qualify as innovation? If so, in what sense, if not, why not? It was not just walking barefoot or walking on foot all these huge distances. It was also about entering into a dialogic politics with the communities that he met, the people that he addressed. And this is how he created a very important movement of popular consciousness, which then facilitated this social innovation. Now, if Chipko is a migratory bird, and this is how I would like to see it, then please note, and I quote Panduranga Hegde, who is the leader of Apiko movement. You know. And Apiko, let's see, he says, like a migratory bird, the Chipko ideology travels 2,500 kilometers from the Himalayas crossing the central India and routes on the west coast in the western Ghats in South India. It got a different name with the same tone known as Apiko, meaning hug the trees in Kannada language. Now, there are three philosophies of Apiko. One is Ulisu, which means to save. And he talks about 5F philosophy to establish ecological health of the soil and the people and the wildlife. Look at the systemic perspective that Apiko takes. And these five species are frit for the fuel wood, fertilizer, and fiber. Belasu, to grow. And Belasu, rational use of forest resources. So the spread of Apiko movement and also particularly in Uttar Kannada, which is supposed to be, or which is, one of the top 15 uh, biodiversity hotspots uh, in the world. These were the special features of this movement, Apiko. Number one, decentralized movement led by local activists. Mobilization of local resources and close collaboration among a small crowd group of coordinators. Wise use of media, especially vernacular media, to popularize the movement, and they, the villagers invited Mr. Sundarlal Bahuguna to come and undertake another foot march in that locality in order to create a normative, normative basis of a pragmatic geopolitics. So the kind of micro geopolitics that you see here is both normative and pragmatic. And then it led to the, this widespread acceptance in popular academic imagination. Now what were the demands of this very important second version of social innovation? Stop the clear felling of the natural forests. Halt the monoculture plantation of single species. Withdraw concessions given to forest-based industries. Moratorium on felling of green trees in the forest regions of Western Ghats. Change the forest policy from commercial objectives to ecological objectives with emphasis on the protection of the natural forests for water security and food security, which are very important components of livelihood security. And what was the outcome? Outcome was considerable success. Moratorium on felling of green trees was accepted by the government. Concessions were withdrawn that were earlier given to forest-based industries. There was a noticeable change in the forest policies in favor of ecological principles. Now the question that arises is that if it was a success, then could that success be sustained? The answer is that in the, in the words of uh, Mr. Hegre, these are some of the questions that uh, he has raised in some of his more recent correspondence with me. Will the movement fizzle out due to the absence of a second line leadership? How conducive is the current social situation in India to launch movements of any kind for any public good? What are the implications of excessive role of media 
consumer culture and attraction of urban way of living for social struggles aiming at innovation. Please note these are the anti-innovation factors and forces which are operating in different contexts that we are faced with. And then he says, have the moments like Apico lost their relevance? Has it become a legend that is incorporated in textbooks in schools rather than to be followed in everyday life? Now there's another example where Chipko moment again traveled like a migratory bird. And this is about Beej Bachao Agdolan, Save the Seeds movement, which is a resistance movement against genetically modified crops. Now, you have Vijay Jardari, who has been at the forefront uh, of this movement. You have Dhoom Singh Negi, who was a very important figure in Chipko movement, who now comes to this new site of challenge, new site of, 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 of domination, new architecture of domination, and says, there was no trade in seeds. Our brides brought seeds with them, and when they went back home on visits, they took with them seeds from here. In this way, seeds were exchanged. So again, you have here a clash of various understandings of development, or as we will call it in Hindi, vikas. Now, my last point is that if Chipko is a migratory bird, there is no reason why this migratory bird would not travel across the Himalayas in China, across China, through the South China Sea, and through the oceans. So if you look for Chipko in marine environments, I'll give you an example. And before that, let me quote James C. Scott, Weapons of the Week. He says, most subordinate classes throughout most of history have been rarely afforded the luxury of open, organized political activity. But as fast as millions of anthazon polyps create willy-nilly a coral reef, so do the multitude of peasant insubordination and evasion create barrier reefs of their own. Uncaught. And I think this is where Professor Jento Bandopanthi very rightly said that, that there are thousands of innovations. In fact, in Uttar Kannada, there are thousands of such struggles for innovation which are going on, but they do not become as visible as Chipko did for some very good reasons. Now, is this not social innovation for resistance at sea? And I quote here John Kurian, the time is very less, so I will very quickly just draw your attention to what's going on. He talks about the state of Kerala where small-scale community-based fisher folk initiated collective action to invest in rejuvenating the natural assets of the sea that had been destroyed by the incessant fishing operations of large-scale bottom trawlers in the region. Please it might be reminded of that wonderful quotation by, please, uh, uh, by James C. Scott and see what these communities did as a strategy of resistance. What they did, they went about erecting artificial reefs at the sea bottom in coastal waters to create anthropogenic marine environments. Reefs act as fish refugia and become source of food for them as the structures are soon covered with bottom dwelling biomass. Artificial reefs placed in strategic positions in the coastal waters can in time increase the overall biomass and the fish stock in the local, local ecosystem. Please note, an unintended side effect of sufficiently large artificial reefs is that they act as a barriers to the operation of bottom trawl nets, effectively performing the role of a sea bottom fence against incursions of trawlers into coastal waters. And I think that is a very fascinating example of how both the intended and unintended effects of a creative social innovation for resistance works at different levels. I conclude with these. Firstly, I want to argue and conclude that once liberated, from various myths and meta-narratives that have evolved around it over a long period of time, the Chipko has a number of valuable insights to offer for those engaged in pursuit of innovation, both at a theoretical conceptual level and in terms of practices of resistance. The ongoing moments such as Apico and the examples that I've given from Kerala are good examples of how the spirit of resistance embodied by the Chipko continues to take new forms, agendas, and challenges in different geographical contexts. It shows the critical importance of political engagements in the wake of attempts to push such movements into a post-political phase. Who does, and, what, and, and what the climate change discourse is doing is precisely this. When you frame forests as the lungs of the planet Earth, as carbon sinks, sometimes you empty out the forests of this very important component of human, cultural, and political geographies. And the question which I would also like to ask is this, who decides whether a particular innovation is liberating, emancipatory, 
or subjugating, dominating. Is innovation a means or an end, especially for those engaged in resistance against the geopolitics of domination? Does the Himalayan Chipko Padyatra undertaken by Bhagun, as I've already said, qualify as an innovation? If so, in what sense? If not, why not? Are there losers and winners in various instances of social innovation? Because in the case of Chipko, social contractors certainly lost. But whether the winners will stay winners in the long run, given the changing context, the neoliberal context, dispossession through accumulation, I mean, I'm borrowing again from, from uh, David Howe's work, is a billion dollar question in my view. Finally, I would say, we also need a conceptual innovation. And when I was going through Gandhiji's uh, following quotation, I thought that can we replace scales with circles? And if we replace scales with circles, particularly oceanic circles, does it create a new imagination and new intellectual space for various kinds of social innovation, not only in India, but also in China, where Judith Shapiro's work and other works that we have seen, not very many, unfortunately, have, have shown as to how new spaces for social resistance are opening up, even if they are fractured there are spaces where we can find even if nascent social protests and movements or potential movements. And Gandhiji says, life will not be a pyramid with the apex sustained by the bottom, but it will be an oceanic circle whose center will be the individual always ready to perish for the village, the latter ready to perish for the circle of villages till at last the whole becomes one life composed of individuals never aggressive in their arrogance, but ever humble, sharing the majesty of the oceanic circle of which they are integral units." Unquote. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jayanti. The coral of innovation and the oceanic circles, I think, are beautiful images take with us. Ah. Next, we have Dong Shikui from Beijing Normal University, our EC fellow, to talk about adaptive management for sustainable resource use. Uh, thank you very much, Brian, uh, for your uh, introduction. Also, thank you very much, Janta, for your brief introduction on my talk. Actually, my talk is very much related to yesterday to uh, present a talk, one is from Pro Professor Bawa, one is from Lu Professor Liu Ji. So uh, today I would also focus on um, uh, grassroots law, uh, level of social innovation, more broadly also extend to uh, maybe technical innovation as well. So uh, before starting my talk, I would like to uh, tell you a, a little bit of story about myself. Actually, I was trained as a pure a grassland ecologist when I was in college. But when I worked with uh, the uh, pastoral community in Qinghai Tibetan Plateau to do some kind of restoration project on degraded grassland and do kind of research on uh, uh, how to cope with climate change, the local uh, herders asked me, can you bring a rainfall for me for, uh, because in recent years, we are very, uh, facing very much problem of uh, shortage water. So I was stuck. And then I told them how to adjust the uh, stocking rate on the grassland. He said, oh, I know the current capacity, but what, what, how can I support my family without, like, let's say, yaku yato, and sheep? So I realized that I needed to do some study on the uh, social pers perspective as well. So now I do kind of a coupled system uh, by bringing into a discipline uh, kind of approach which is called coupled social ecological study. So today I will bring some of my study in uh, Himalaya region in, uh, from uh, Nepal, India to China. So uh, this just a kind of uh, outline. I will talk a little about how um, in terms of resource use, I will focus grassland because I'm trained as a grassland scientist. And also I will uh, talk a little bit on what's the effect of climate, uh, global change and uh, uh, what's the impact of these changes and how local adaptation, uh, what are uh, uh, like 
local adaptation there, and what a strategy that we, we should uh, take care to enhance this kind of adaptive uh, management. So uh, yesterday, actually, uh, Professor uh, Baba already gave you a very uh, um, uh, I mean, concrete uh, uh, view about the uh, Himalaya region. Actually, uh, in terms of AC mode, actually, uh, when we talk about the Himalaya, he, uh, AC mode extends the whole Himalaya region into western part to uh, Afghanistan and also to northern part towards the end of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau. So uh, I would like to say this uh, particular uh, I mean, unit is very, very important in terms of uh, geological location, also kind of uh, a role ecosystem services they're pl uh, playing. So totally there are around uh, 4.3 million of hectare of uh, 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 area, and uh, which uh, support around 150 million of people uh, living upstream and three times more at the upstream, uh, downstream, sorry. And uh, when we look at the uh, land use covered in this particular area, over 50% of this land were covered by grassland. So you can imagine how important grassland is in this area. So grassland is not only kind of resources here, but also it's kind of landscape and ecosystem, which is play very important role. Like we have very beautiful landscapes in Lantang, uh, Nepal, and. Uh, uh, Qiangtang in China, Tibetan side, and Na Chu, as well as Yushu and uh, Guolo, which is uh, called three head uh, uh, water area. So uh, when we look at the uh, ecosystem uh, million uh, assessment, so uh, normally the defined the ecosystem provide four kinds of services to, to human beings by supporting provisioning regulating and the culture. When we look at the grassland here, we found uh, the grassland uh, definitely provide all these kind of uh, services for uh, 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 human beings, like probably uh, yesterday uh, uh, Professor Baba already mentioned, like uh, a lot of uh, fiber, food, fuel, minerals, timber, non-timber uh, forestry products, fresh water, and also a lot of flora and fauna there. And in terms of culture, you can, you can imagine many, many uh, same groups uh, living the, the, in this particular area, like the Daman people in Nepal and the Tibetan people in, in China. A lot of them are doing either uh, gra pastoralists or semi-pastoralists there. So in terms of uh, cultural perspective, there is very much diversity, ethnic group, religion, linguistic, cultural diversity associated with this unique tradition along uh, and along history. So regulation, of course, it's uh, not only regulate the what balance uh, upstream, but also downstream. A lot of Himalaya water uh, uh, were may first were uh, holding by grassland in high altitude and uh, discharged step by step to uh, low land to, uh, like, let's say, Bangladesh uh, and uh, Western Bengal in India and also uh, some other regions. So downstream people uh, depend on this kind of uh, water to do kind of agricultural production and uh, also other kind of activities as well. So, but nowadays, this kind of uh, ecosystem resources face very much problem of degradation due to kind of global change. Let's say yesterday some people asked what's the drivers behind the grass and degradation. I would like to say there are multiple drivers. Let's see what, what, what's, what are they. Look, here in terms of global change, we, we, yesterday Professor uh, Bawa said that the warming, uh, we did a very, uh, it's not me, but, but other scientists who are doing the uh, climate change. They found that the, uh, 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 clearly trends in the particular site that the warming is there. Uh, particularly some, uh, just like similar to Bowers, finding that 1.5 degrees, degree increase there. But uh, in some uh, other places, people uh, uh, did interview on the local herd, they said in some uh, year, there's an extremely cold winter. So there's, uh, I mean, a lot of variations and variability and uncertainty in terms of climate temperature. Also in terms of uh, what issue, I mean, the precipitation, 
there's a yearly variation and the seasonally variation, very much dynamic nowadays. I mean, uh, local people said uh, there's much more uh, kind of uh, uh, uncertainty than before. And also kind of uh, uh, glacier uh, melting, which of course influenced grassland uh, uh, a lot because when you look at the topography, the glacier melting, then the water comes first to the grassland and feed the grassland. The grassland may hold in some water and if there's no good health grassland, the runoff will be increased. So there's no enough uh, water there to uh, uh, to support the, this uh, kind of ecosystem there. And of, of course, uh, there's a kind of population growth and also lovely uh, love, uh, livestock uh, population growth as well. Uh, some people did, uh, FAO did a very good study in a county which is based in Qinghai province. And they found that uh, since uh, uh, 1950s, there's a tremendous uh, in increase of both human population and uh, livestock population. So um, uh, it's a kind of a tripled even during the, that period. I would, uh, I would like to mention uh, in terms of uh, a livestock population increase after uh, 1980s, there's a policy uh, in China actually which is uh, called grassland individualization or privatization policy which uh, mentioned by yeah. Professor Lu Zhi yesterday. Actually, when uh, China government did the uh, kind of individualization, individualization of grassland, first in early 1980s, uh, they individualized the livestock first. So that means uh, uh, a lot of communal livestock were distributed in, into individual household. After 10 years, uh, 1990s, they individual, uh, individualized the grassland. So within these 10 years, what happening? I, I would like to say that a kind of a tragedy of compound resources happening because more and more people want to uh, come near grassland grazing. So <coughs> that period is really, I mean, very much related to the uh, policy driven. So here I would like to say, uh, in terms of a policy perspective, we have a, a kind of a policy which is a uh, grassland indi individualization. Also, Professor Lu Zhi mentioned yesterday about fencing grassland ban, which influenced a lot on the grassland uh, ecosystem. So also kind of a global uh, land use, land cover change uh, uh, based on kind of a uh, photo monetary study. This is a very cool study done by American, uh, uh, American scientists, uh, oh, photographer. So um, uh, actually, Li, uh, um, Professor Li Bo now know uh, about this because uh, he, he worked with this guy, uh, uh, Joseph Rock, uh, uh, closely. What he found is, here you can find, uh, he did a very good photo in, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 100 years ago in the Burma, uh, Burma Pass. Uh, we can clearly see here is, a, here is a tree line, which means above this area is grassland. But after uh, uh, 80 years later, the grassland disappeared, moved to tree line, moved up. Why? Because there may be two kind of driven, uh, driven forces behind one. There may be climate change due to climate uh, warming, maybe a uh, tree line increase. Another point is actually there's a logging ban since uh, 1970s or 80s. So tree were not allowed to cut down. And also local traditional use of grassland was changed too. Uh, the, the fire, the, Actually, local people do fire to control the uh, shrubbers, but now which is banned, so uh, shrub increased day by day, which occupied a lot of grassland. So this kind of a change there. So also kind of a, uh, um, development, which is like the railway built, uh, Tibetan railway built along this area, destroyed a lot of land there. And of course, come traditional uh, livelihood kind of change modern machinery there, so this kind of uh, uh, change happening there. So what's the impact of this kind of change? Let's see, grassland degradation is very much a big uh, issue there due to this kind of influence. Let's see, since the 1980s to 1990s, there's uh, the degraded grassland increase in, in several, uh, let's say, provinces in uh, Qinghai Tibetan Plateau area, and which caused a lot of biodiversity loss 
uh, of course, yesterday Professor Bava said that the dominant species, most of them disappeared. Endemic species also lost as well. So that means habitat of wildlife were degraded too. And also which influenced very much on the local livelihoods. Look, uh, Tibetan people, they are living in headwater area. In, uh, in the past, they had plenty of water, but now there's uh, like uh, one case from Chimalai country, which is uh, called Wat Tower on Tianhai Tibetan Plateau. The number of water will decrease from 138 in the past to only eight, eight in 2000. And 80% uh, of uh, inhabitants in the town have to buy water from outside. So this is a uh, very uh, crucial uh, problem. I will not repeat this slide because yesterday Luigi already, uh, Professor Luigi already mentioned that that's kind of a eco migration or eco resettlement, which also influences a lot on local livelihood. Uh, of course, there's an upstream downstream relationship. If there's no uh, in, uh, enough uh, ecosystem saves on grassland, the downstream people influence a lot. So, how can we uh, 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 treat, uh, copy with this kind of a change? There's two kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, strategy by the risk management and uh, another one resilience enhancement. So I will uh, focusing on resilience enhancement. Now there's more, a lot of people are questioning sustainability. So let's talk about resilience. Resilience enhancement is the capacity of social and ecological system to absorb disturbances and still remain their best function structure. This is uh, defined by some scholars. So to understand the adaptive strategies and their functions, a number of questions need to clarify. What are they? How they work? To what extent? And can these strategies be improved in the light of more current knowledge about uh, global change? Uh, how can this be uh, done? So adapt to the climate change is about knowledge enhancement. The low capacity uh, let's say knowledge work for adaptation to be changed are preparedness mobility, social networks, diversification, classification, and exchange, and the local uh, specific. So I did some kind of case study across Himalayan region I mentioned earlier. One is in Himachal Prabhupada Dish, India. One is in Rosawa District, of Nepal. And one, two in, uh, uh, one is in Gansu, one is in uh, uh, Qinghai, China. So I found that uh, this, uh, in the long tradition, uh, local people use a very good kind of system. It's called transhumanity and the rotational ground system uh, in three sides. Uh, when we look at the India and the Nepali side, they are very much similar. Their move are very high altitude, uh, let's say air palmetto in summer, and the move down to low uh, altitude forest <coughs> in winter, this kind of a system. They also did a very good uh, combination of different uh, animals' comp composition. When we look at that, uh, uh, Left side uh, picture we can find the combined the yak and yak cattle breeds very much uh, efficiently because actually cross breeds they can adapt to the uh, uh, lower altitude much better than uh, yak. So this kind of uh, strategy is used with a very loud tradition. So in terms of China side and uh, Tibetan plateau, they do not move to that long, uh, lower elevation, but they still do a um, kind of long routine uh, uh, migration uh, kind of grazing, uh, which is uh, based on the palmetto, but still uh, long um, uh, kind of. Uh, and also, uh, I did a very uh, a good study in uh, Nepal side. We found the local institution plays a very important role to, uh, let's say, uh, sustainable grassland management. They have the elected body committee to make decisions. They have self-organized association, well defined, designed civil regulations among themselves, and the rules evolved from traditional and the reality. That's really cool. So I, I found that's really I an mean, important part we should learn uh, from China side, because nowadays we lose this kind of a local institution in China because of uh, land individualization, blah, blah. So uh, in terms of uh, climate change, how local people adjust or adapt, they're doing kind of early, uh, early grazing on the, uh, on the uh, grassland because uh, Professor Bava and myself found the, the temperature grazing or uh, increasing. So they need to move up uh, highland earlier than before. So, so this kind of, uh, uh, that's kind of a transition they have. And also, local people uh, work with uh, 
uh, scientists like myself as well, did a very uh, kind of a job on restore the degraded grassland by cultivating, cultivating perennial grasses. In the past, I actually have some appearances of cultivating the oat, but you know, oat is an annual crop which we are may not very good to protect the soil in that area, particularly on the very degraded grassland which we call black soil, black beach. The, there's no uh, turf, I mean, no soil at all because it's totally eroded by either evergreening or global warming or whatever. That uh, uh, turf were totally removed by wind or water erosion. So we needed to restore this kind of uh, uh, grassland. So we worked very uh, closely with local people. Local people also accept uh, uh, some of uh, our uh, technical suggestions and did some good job at it. And of course, they, they did some uh, diversity buying the lovely house because I uh, mentioned earlier, there's a, a pressure of uh, population growth. So they do not have enough land to support this growing population. So in, the, in one family, maybe they have in the past, at the beginning of 1980s, they just get a small amount, a uh, certain amount of uh, grassland, but nowadays, their kids, maybe they have three kids, they, one, they will divide the, this land into three, so that's a big challenge for them. So they divide their, their, their kind of uh, livelihood into other uh, style, like uh, tourists and also uh, kind of uh, migratory work, whatever, so this kind of uh, uh, change there. So what I found from the case study in uh, these three areas, uh, in terms of social point of view, uh, collective herding on Chen Hai Tibetan Plateau are happening, particularly in Sichuan and uh, part of Gansu province. People come together, and because they have very short land, so they bring the animal together and share their land together. So collective feed production also happening. Public foundation for grazing. Uh, cooperation among farmers association in Nepal, uh, Himalaya are found uh, already mentioned. User groups as, uh, action for conflicting mitigation in Nepal and the Himalaya, uh, India Himalaya. I would mention that there is uh, one policy uh, change in, in both in uh, India and uh, Nepal. What I found in Nepal, they have very uh, strong uh, policy on community forestry. So a lot of people, they feel very difficult to move down their livestock to grazing on, in the com uh, communal community. So they need to uh, negotiate with the local people by paying fees. So this kind of user groups uh, negotiation happening there to deal with this kind of uh, problem. And also India side, due to the, uh, a, a lot, uh, all the grassland were located by the Ministry of Forestry. So they need to work with the forestry department very closely and uh, uh, solve the problem. So uh, this is a uh, kind of uh, fun. So in order to uh, enhance this kind of adaptive, adaptive management, what can we do? We need to do institutional uh, develop, development. Both uh, scientists and policymakers should look at how we can empower local knowledge and uh, integrate this knowledge into our scientific research and also policy making. Because I find local knowledge is a kind of a scientific knowledge, you know. Because in the past, actually, we, we overlooked this important part, so which is very important. So also, we needed to build very strong institutions uh, for a resilient society. Uh, and also, good governance is behind. Uh, so uh, because of time limitation, I will not uh, go very detailed. So uh, um, right now, uh, based on this kind of stuff I learned from uh, Nepal, uh, uh, India, I uh, currently developed a, a key project uh, funded by Chinese government. I want to do a kind of transect study uh, across whole grassland area in uh, Qinghai Tibetan Plateau and by looking at how bring social uh, coupled, uh, uh, sorry, coupled social uh, ecos ecological system into my study by looking at two, uh, in using interdisciplinary study. So I hope uh, in the future we, we might be integrated all dimensions together and uh, get a sustainable air uh, power uh, grassland area. With uh, this, um, I would like to uh, thank the new school uh, for uh, big support. Without this support, I would never go beyond the Nepal to India, So, uh, which embroiled my study 
And also, I would like to Asia Scholarship Foundation, which gave me opportunity to study in Nepal. And also, my government, Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Environmental Protection, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, supported me a lot in terms of financially. And also, I would like to thank my two organizations, Cornell University and Beijing Normal, which provide a lot of humor and uh, all kinds of facilities to support my study. At the end, I would like to share this picture with all of you. Let's get a Haromani society. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, Victoria Marshall, uh, my colleague at Parsons, the new School of Design. And uh, she's going to talk about uh, designing urban environmental activism. So my uh, talk is titled Urban Design in Urban Ecology uh, for Calcutta and India and Shaoxing, China. For my India China Fellowship, uh, I want to offer you a design project um, today. Um, and I'm positioning this project as a contribution to the emerging field of urban ecology. And I'm using comparative examples from two cities in India and China that represent different mixtures of different city models. So to date, urban ecology has been defined mostly by ecosystem scientists and less so by urban designers. So this project aims to rebalance that trend by offering drawing set that critically translates ecosystem science frameworks and emerging city models into urban designs. So urban designers McGrath, who you know, and Shane, uh, my professor, uh, have described three city models, metropolis, megalopolis, and the networked and multi-form metacity as competing theories of symbolic form social order, and environmental metabolism, each with the specific roles for urban designers to imagine, represent, and shape. So for example, the um, signature architect, the star architect, is the urban actor for the metropolis. The anonymous corporate firm or government firm is the actor for the megalopolis. And the megacity and its slums attract the social scientists, the NGOs, and the global institutions. So my project engages uh, all of these city actors and models and practices. Um, by, I mapped their interventions and interfaces in the two cities. And this was also informed by my field work for two and a half years and my research. Um, and also a novel land cover classification called Patch Dynamics, designed by the urban ecologist uh, Stuart Pickett, who we met yesterday, and Mary Cadenasso. Um, and this uh, uh, Patch Dynamics uh, accounts for the heterogeneity of urban environments. And this project then proposes spaces and practice for practices for the Meta City Urban Ecology. So Calcutta and Shaoxing are located in the two mega deltas whose rivers have their source in the Himalay. In the Ganges Brahmaputra River Delta, mega delta in India, the urban process of the mega city is the dominant model. It is characterized by significant, the mega city is characterized by significant pressures on people, transit, resources, housing, extreme density, and the absorption of agricultural land brought about by its extensive sprawl. The, in, 
the densely inhabited north-south corridor along the Hooghly River between the Ganges River and the Sundarbans is the larger site for my study. And the local case study is the rapidly changing eastern edge of Calcutta, located where it meets the East Calcutta wetlands. Uh, yeah, we have people from Calcutta here. And um, the border with Bangladesh. OK, in the Yangtze River mega delta in China, the urban process that is dominant is the megalopolis. Um, and this is characterized by concerted attempts to avoid the unrestrained growth of slums and informal development that are present in the megacity model. This is why they're twinned processes. So the megalopolis is an extended urban region. And in China, the repetitive and the financially efficient units of the mega block, the mega node, uh, the new town, the mega mall, uh, eco park, uh, high rise clusters, all connected by high speed trains and six to, set, six to eight lane highways, are the character of the megalopolis. And the larger scale of my study is the Nanjing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Ningbo, uh, Z shaped city. <coughs> Um, and the local case study is the northern edge of the city of Shaoxing, uh, which is on the southern shore of Hangzhou Bay. Okay, Calcutta. On the eastern edge of Calcutta, urban change, in my analysis, is sequential and invisibly sectional. As the groundwater extraction of the city of Calcutta exceeds the recharge, a newly built wider road called the Eastern Metropolitan Bypass, has fostered the conditions that make it economically viable for the landowners to transform ponded and waterlogged dry land on the edge of and in the East Calcutta wetlands. So a new town, an IT zone, new hospitals, five-star hotels, fancy schools, uh, shopping malls, big box retail, uh, gated high-rise housing clusters, government offices, business headquarters, have all transformed uh, this road corridor uh, into the city's eastern waterfront. In turn, uh, in this mix of old and new and wet and dry, it has uh, fostered in, se in the sequence conditions for newer and also proposed projects of flyovers, light rail, subway extensions, street widening, and sewage canal upgrading. Typically, these projects are not coordinated with each other or add up to any legible, sensible, or as far as I can tell, intelligible fi final urban image other than to create the conditions for their continuing implementation. And Bajanti Rao actually calls this phenomenon infrastructural urbanism. So within the context of this, uh, I, what I'm describing, open-ended, speculative, and sequential change with no goal, uh, my project proposes an urban intervention that generates a physical, digital, and discursive space for science uh, uh, to interact directly with people. Using readily available satellite imagery and simple handheld sensors, experts in what I call pond neighborhoods create a patch dynamic picture that affords residents a way to imagine change and monitor their own ecosystems assisted by ecologists who uh, what we heard yesterday is, is changing, who are looking for new ways to identify scientific priorities in cities. This adaptive mosaic approach um, permits a diversity of research questions to emerge from adjacent and quite similar urban patchy landscapes. It also allows for contesting views and practices to coexist. Um, in, in India, 
environmental data that measures ecosystem services can then be shared or engaged as leverage, which I understood from Nidhi's research, um, for increased resources or new uh, hybrid partnerships. These pond neighborhoods are in turn located in a larger wetland borderland uh, that surrounds an even larger water body, in this case, the charismatic East Calcutta wetlands that was recently designated by the Ramsar Convention as a wetland of international importance. The wetland borderland is uh, uh, imagined as, as this, um, in, as acting in between the space of no borders and the space of a hard border that is impossible to fix in place. The wetland borderland street life is a space of interaction following what I learned from Dong, a transhumanist model that allows a complementary exploitation of resources between highlands and lowlands. So in a delta landscape, in this case, therefore, the lowlands are the wetland, fish farm, recycling, ecotourism landscape on the inside of the borderland. And the, highland, ha, the highlands are the levee city of Calcutta, uh, just um, inches above the lowlands. Uh, in between, these streets are described and analyzed and changed and monitored in section in centimeters on the surface and meters below the ground to the groundwater. And in form, uh, they follow the nested pulsations of monsoon rains, rituals, and everyday commuting, each of which today regularly uh, reorganize the city. Okay, Shaoxing. In the northern edge of Shaoxing, urban change is uh, simultaneous and visibly sectional. In Calcutta, it was sequential and invisibly sectional. Grids of mega blocks with many bridges are built over the existing water network. At the same time, economic and technological development zones and new towns are phased in as the water villages are systematically shut down and phased out. Uh, in my observations, water-based practices persist, such as waterfront vegetable and clothes washing, I think that you just saw, and also fish farming. I also observed the food gardens are continuously replanted on the fertile soil that is continuously seem to be moved around with the heavy machinery in preparation for new office towers, residential buildings, clusters, and eco parks. In addition, I observed that um, dredging and shoreline stabilization to accommodate the long distance cargo transportation is actually increasing. In China, this pattern occurs in many areas or in the mega delta. Uh, this pattern occurs in many areas at once. Um, for the past 10 years and led by multiple five year concurrent and coordinated strategic land use master plans. So in the same format I just described for Calcutta, this project proposes an adaptive mosaic approach in order to generate a physical, digital, and discursive space for science to interact directly with people. In China, environmental data can be used for cooperation and co-management, I also learned that from Nidhi, um, who's speaking next. As the Chinese People Republic isn't equipped to handle negotiation by direct confrontation. The spatial strategy is as follows. Um, canal neighborhoods, I call them, are located in a larger, what I call shoreline borderland that runs parallel with the existing high-speed train corridors and long-distance canals. In this ca case, the canal neighborhoods run perpendicular to the Hangzhou Ningbo Canal, which is currently being upgraded by the 
Zhejiang, which is the province, inland waterway renaissance action plan uh, from 2000, it's dated 2011 to 2015, so it's just started uh, uh, in what I saw. Um, so this main canal forms the southern extension of the famous Grand Canal, which the Chinese people, uh, People's Political Consultative Conference is currently seeking UNESCO World Heritage status as a property of outstanding universal value. So the shoreline borderland is a new spatial model for urban change that includes and hybridizes uh, hoku experiments, water transportation, urban food production, and nighttime environment design. Uh, it's designed that it, so that it can be expanded um, in the mega delta, which I drew, um, in order to generate ideas for change inside the space of the singular official culture where tremendous work is being undertaken to keep it in place in China. Um, the shoreline borderland is a linear space in which, again, the transhuman model engaged, uh, engages the lowlands of the water surface and the highlands, actually, of the farmland, but also high-rise uh, buildings, uh, dwellers. Um, so this section <coughs> goes this way, not that way. Um, it aims to provide options for people for whom mostly move from their high-rise apartment now to their car, scooter, or bus in order to go to work, shop, study, visit friends or family. It bypasses the, the road culture, which is the new city being built, and correlates water and train-based movements with the nested pulsations uh, in Hangzhou of winter damp, because it's built below the Yangtze River, there's no heat in winter. Um, summer humidity and the golden weeks, such as Chinese Lunar New Year and National Day, each of which today regularly reorganize the city. Similar to Thanksgiving that just reorganized our country. <laughs> we have these resortings periodically. Um, so these two linked projects aim to fill out the potential of urban ecology by linking urban ecological systems and new spatial strategies into an iterative loop where data and urban interventions can create discursive and physical spaces for new models to emerge continuously. And I think that's the key word. Following a, an adaptive mosaic and non-equilibrium paradigm, it is a project that acknowledges the open-endedness of ecosystems. Um, it is also a project that aims to generate options that can replace the twinned and unsustainable urban processes of the megacity and the megalopolis, uh, both of which are being actively engaged in what uh, Sanjay framed for me, um, the advancing party state, uh, sorry, the advancing state party of India and the retreating party state of China. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for that beautiful visual treat. Um, the lights have been restored to your satisfaction, Needy. I would like to introduce you to um, Needy uh, Srinivas, uh, again, a new school fellow at the India China Institute. I don't see Needy. Where is he? He's behind you. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew.
Yeah, you know, and Often, then, yes. You might be able to put the whole thing into the screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I would, uh, uh, my name is Nidhi Srinivas. I teach at the New School. I teach courses on management and policy and it, NGOs. My interest has always been in social theory. And so what I'm presenting to you will seem a little different from the presentations you've just heard. And so my purpose is to begin by very quickly framing uh, what you're about to see in terms of the larger project that the fellows uh, share. Uh, we agreed by consent to affirm our commonalities, but to also assert our commonalities within some level of complementary divergence. And so my presentation is going to be more social theoretical. There's going to be less empirical detail, and I'm going to rather deliberately try to show some vivid images to have us reflect on them. That, that's my goal. I'd like to signal very explicitly that I share the following among many commonalities with my dear fellows. Um, I have a commitment to local people in the same way as Dong Shikui does in the presentation he showed you, to the ways in which technologies can unearth in different ways unusual po political responses, as uh, Victoria has just shown in her presentation, and especially with Sanjay Chaturvedi's commitment to notions of micropolitics and the ways that landscapes and politics are embedded in each other. Um, I'd like to begin with a quote which many of you will know, if I could just read it out to you. I'm seeking to rescue the poor stockinger, the Luddite cropper, the obsolete handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded followers of Joanne Southcott from the enormous condescension of posterity. These are the opening lines of uh, the making of the English working class, uh, the classic work of English social history. Thompson, of course, is being ironic. He isn't trying to rescue them because he believes they have not yet been destroyed. Posterity here is therefore a word to be taken with some care. Uh, the book begins at the cusp of a long, extraordinarily painful cycle of environmental destruction that we are all immersed in. Uh, in fact, to some uh, philosophers, it takes an incredible effort to actually imagine the world differently. Um, I don't wish to imply that the Industrial Revolution was all bad. It shaped everything we are, after all, including the PowerPoint slide uh, that I was about to show you, which is now a PDF uh, format. However, I do wish to acknowledge that one way to understand the environment, one way to understand politics, is for us to also acknowledge the people who struggle with it. And I am in no way implying my authority over them, but I wish to be greatly respectful to them. And so what follows are their narratives as I've done my best to understand them. The term social innovation, which has come up in a couple of our presentations, has a specific set of meanings. I'm placing this for those who wish to know those meanings. It typically means new ideas that work in meeting social goals, new concepts, strategies, and initiatives, products and processes, or organizations that meet pressing social needs. So one understanding of social innovation is to see it as a set of tools. And if we see it in that way, we can say that the ecological situation we're in today can be de dealt with in terms of problems and ways in which cer certain um, uh, concepts, practices can be made into tools. I, however, would like to argue that social innovations are not just tools. I'd like to argue that they're actually clusters of practices and that they unleash peculiar trajectories of politics. Let me begin by showing you some images which may give us an indication of them as tools. And before I do that, I want to just quickly give you an indication of the areas I studied. The images you're seeing are images that also evoke the ecosystems. Two areas I especially studied are in Rajasthan in India, Udaipur. As you can see, this is a semi-arid landscape with occasional water reservoirs, such as the one behind the woman you're seeing in the photograph, but it is a rocky, rather forbidding landscape. Um, if you can look, uh, it's a little hard to read, but if you can look up, I've tried to sort of compress a lot of my information into a set of key points. The point two indicates the key environmental problems there. These are deforestment, encroachment into government forest areas as well as depleting water and uh, degradation of existing water sources. The responses are typically through village collectives organized by NGOs. The NGOs also subsidize pumps, and they use this in a way to work with the state, co-management, if you will, uh, to deal with the environmental crisis. 
A second location that I studied is within uh, China. This is uh, in the part of Yunnan that borders uh, Burma, the Gaoligong Shan uh, Reserve, as some call it. This is a semi-humid area with thick, very thick uh, vegetation. It's one of the key areas of biodiversity in the planet. Um, it has been, su it's suffering from qu qu problems of deforestation as well as encroachment. Uh, responses have typically involved empowering communities so that they actually monitor the reserves themselves, uh, increasing different types of income sources so that they don't have to cut down the trees, as well as forms of other cooperation with the government ministries. If I could just quickly signal to you, I was struck by an important difference in my field work in Rajasthan as well as in Yunnan. In Rajasthan, the NGO I studied uh, tried to work with the government but wasn't entirely successful and in a certain sense operated as a complement to the state. Um, in uh, Yunnan, the NGOs I studied worked exclusively with the government and in fact at times it was hard to distinguish uh, what could be called a civil society from what could be called a state. Now, these are some examples, if you wish, of social innovations. Here's one. These are pump sharing groups. The gentleman in the middle is having a register. The register indicates how much money has uh, been paid by each of the members of these groups, and in return, water is released accordingly. Uh, this is one of the pumps that has been subsidized by the NGO in Rajasthan. Uh, on the left, you have a beehive, which is a modern beehive. You can use it without destroying the honeycomb. Traditional beehives in different parts of the world, uh, when you open, uh, the beehive, the honeycomb is destroyed, the bees die, and thus you remove the honey. Here, you can retain the beecomb. On the right, you have an energy efficient stub, which improves the eyesight of those who uh, use the wood that's used in the stub, overwhelmingly women, but it also reduces the number of trees that you need to cut to keep such a stub going. Um, this, all three images you're seeing here are from an area near Udaipur in Rajasthan. And they basically show you how uh, existing water source is being maintained. The existing water source at the is at the bottom of the three pictures. On the left-hand side on the top, you see a local uh, member of a low caste community who is a scavenger uh, that is paid by a village collective to take the trash around the water area so that the water is not contaminated. And on the right-hand side, you see an image which is not all that clear, but it says in Hindi, Jal Mandir literally the temple of water, and the water that's pouring out of that tap is from this restored water source. So here you have, a, if you wish, a very classic example of a degraded water source that has been, if you wish, improved and could qualify as an example of social innovation. On the left, you have community forest wardens. May I just acknowledge at the extreme right of the image on your left-hand side, my dear friend and colleague, Yang Shu, who was my translator while I was doing my research in Yunnan. On the right-hand side, you see a person on the left describing a forest use council and the way it functions. Now, at this point, if I were to stop this presentation, I could tell you what you've seen are social innovations. And I could, in fact, perhaps, given my training in management, encourage models of social innovation, and then we could try to find funding for these models of social innovation. And this would be a particularly familiar road I could traverse. It's a road I was trained to traver traverse, and maybe that's why I don't wish to traverse it. I actually would prefer to step away from this. The, I would go, like to go without evoking Robert Frost any further, the road less traveled. Um, the word social innovation has many meanings. And it is intriguing to recognize how those meanings have changed over time. Social innovation was historically not a tool. It was a phrase used to identify a problem. The problem was the problem of socialism. There were people who were very uncomfortable with royalty, with monarchies, they wanted to band together and fight it. So if you look at this quote, forgive me, if you look at this quote here in the middle, uh, this is the quote by Monsieur Guizot. It's in French, I will read it out in translation in English. All the political parties, all the social innovators, all the passions, all the ideas, all the dreams of these revolutionaries appear in this anarchy. This anarchy that's being described in this quote by Monsieur Guizot from the mid-18th mid, uh, century uh, is the efforts by local French populations to fight for their freedom. Uh, if you wish, Monsieur Guizot is basically giving you a commentary on the rupture of the French Revolution. So, social innovation actually originates as a tremendous level of anxiety with the socialist impulses of citizens. So it is particularly intriguing to see how the term has then shifted over time. 
So if you look on the second of the three bullet points on this page, the shifts in meaning have gone from socialism to social reform. Some of the early uses of the phrase in the English language uh, in, in the United States and in Britain are in terms of social reform. Social adjustments to technological growth, influential books on technology start to use the phrase social innovation by the 1950s, including, uh, of course, the famous uh, classic books of uh, Schumpeter. And more recently, it has started to become a little debased so that it simply means something new. So what you have is a term that was initially used to be anti-capitalist, that was something to be abjured if you believed in capitalism and today stands for efforts supportive of capitalism. And in that sense is often used and evoked by influential foundations, underwritten by different types of um, foundations that I would say live and rely on the existing model of capitalism that we all uh, are part of. Now, the reason I'm signaling this to you is to signal a particular notion of politics. Social innovation, I would argue, is not a tool. It's not a set of tools. It's actually a way in which we name uh, clusters of practices that are responses to the existing world. And the world that I just showed you in which the beehives, the stoves exist, is a world of declining resources. It's a world where people are trying to make sense of the way in which their markets and societies function. It's a world which some say is dominated by neoliberal capitalism. Uh, it may be more correct to say it's dominated by a particular way in which we imagine the market and the state. And I think that may be the wisest way to leave it for some discussion. My purpose in pointing this out is to say, if it is then not about technology and tools in an unproblematic sense, what is political about social innovation? What is it we can pull out from this and sort of identify and say, aha, here's something that maybe both normatively but also descriptively is something we can either champion or at least identify. Now, there are various ways I could do it, but I'm going to do it by sharing two stories, and I'm going to situate these stories through two quotes and images. And this is, I should just indicate, if it isn't obvious by now, that this will also end my presentation, since I do believe I will be running out of time shortly in any case. So on the top of this image, you see uh, a, a, a mushroom that was located in one of the villages near Gaoligong Shan that's often farmed. At the bottom, you see an image of a woman leader in one of the villages near uh, Udaipur, and her hand is outstretched because she's having a rather tense argument. And the gentleman on the top who's showing you the mushroom happens to be a forest warden, and as you will see in the image that follows, he's the same person on the right-hand side on the bottom uh, photograph. And he's also having an argument, though it may not seem that tense. Um, perhaps uh, the, the photograph was taken and they were more careful in how they showed the images. So what you have here are two images of contestation. The quotes indicate the contestation. The first quote from the village near Udaipur, he, the gentleman on the left-hand side in that photograph wearing a turban who's smiling is saying, I will part with the water on my land only at the point of a gun. In short, I'm not going to share my water. The image on the, right, on the bottom on the left-hand side the gentleman who is speaking to the warden is saying, if you cannot give us more funds, then we prefer to receive no funds because it's causing disharmony in the village. Now, the backstory behind this is that the top image you're looking at is uh, during a furious discussion by village councils, what they're trying to do is trying to establish how they can actually deal with the water resources in the village. The, the gentleman in the turban has water. He's not willing to share it in the village council meeting, he becomes rather furious and states very firmly, this water is my right, I don't have to share it. However, because of the insistence in the, in, of the meeting and the woman who you may see who's staring at the camera <laughs> in the back of the photograph because of her insistence, at the end of the meeting he did agree to share the water. In short, you have a moment of contestation, you have a question, what is it we have in common? Well, we don't have this water in common. But because of the political effort involved, that moment of contestation leads to some effort at sharing. At the bottom, what is happening is that the Chinese, the equivalent of the Chinese ministry in this area is telling the, the gentleman in the Gaoligong Shan, we can give you five beehives for your village, but we can't give you more. And he says, look, if you can give us five, we don't want any. Because five beehives basically means some of us are going to fight with some others. Some of us will get the beehives and will be resented by others. It'll cause disharmony. Give more beehives or just don't give any. 
So in both images, I would argue, you have a certain visioning of what a community is. You have a certain set of agen agential work, uh, activities through which you try to define a community. And in both images, these are impelled through existing technological and social innovations. And this leads to what I want to conclude with. I'd say these stories point to a particular kind of politics. And it's a politics of contestation. What is it we think is in common? In short, what is it people who have to share a common resource agree is in common as something they can hold on to as a part of their community? I would argue that because you place them in a place of propinquity, they have forced to come to some level of agreement. But that agreement could happen in all sorts of ways. And what's interesting for me is to see how the inherent antagonisms that emerge in such sharing uh, are dealt with. The second is contradictions, moments of dramatic rupture, moments when a certain narrative just doesn't work anymore. How do you then handle that? What are the ways in which you respond? For instance, how do you respond if you're a forest warden and you're told, thank you for giving us five beehives. We know you went through a lot of work with your uh, members of your hierarchy, but we don't want them. They're just not enough. It's better we don't have any at all. Or how do you deal with the moment where a very powerful person in a village council says, no, I don't have to agree with the NGO. I don't have to agree with you people. So I would say these are the aspects of politics that both interest me and that I found in my research. I've deliberately left my presentation unconclusive because I don't wish to give you the impression there is a conclusion. We live in a dire moment. It's a market-friendly setting. Uh, neither India nor China strike me as countries that are, whose leaders have at the moment recognized the tremendous cost to their environment through the way in which they've imagined their industrial growth. I do believe as an Indian citizen, China has been a little more thoughtful in this regard, but I don't believe we have much of a room for optimism. The room for optimism depends on these moments of rupture, and it depends in my personal view on the extent we have a commitment to these stories, to the people involved in these narratives of history, so that they do not just disappear, so that if even in Benjamin's terms they are propelled into progress with their face backwards, um, through the new angels that we can imagine. Thank you very much.